So Lauren, it's such a pleasure to have you here in Switzerland yes. at ValueX. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come out all this way to be at this conference. And I guess before I go into your great uncle, um, how long have you known about ValueX and when did you make the decision you were going to come out here? You know, that's a tough question. I've known about ValueX for a long time, many years. I mean, how long has it been going on now? 10? 11 or 12. 11 or 12. I feel like I've known about it for, I don't know, eight or nine years. And I've always wanted to come. And I have two children, 10 and 13. It's difficult to travel, as you will notice. My kids tag along with me on many work trips. They go to Berkshire Hathaway AGM every year with me, really because I have to bring them. I don't have child care outside of that. Um, but this year I made a commitment to do some of the things I've really wanting to do for many years. And this was one of them. So I reached out to you and scored an invitation. Well, I'm so grateful that you're here. And um, because you're kind of like one of the, uh, firm, you're in the firmament. You're there as one of the constellations in this kind of world that if you enter into and you decide that you want to make it your world, then you're going to be in the world with Lauren Templeton. And the first time I met you, I remember, was uh, around the Wesco meeting. Yes. So you were a regular attendee of the Wesco meeting. But I think that all of us there have a, have a slight envy because because for you, we had to come and sort of worship at the church of Ben Graham, Warren Buffett and the like. But you have it in your blood. I do. Tell us about what it's like to have Sir John Templeton in your blood what that means to you, what you've learned, how you mm -hmm. came to where you are right now. Yeah, well, it is an unusual experience to have John Templeton as your great uncle. I grew up in a small town in Tennessee, a uh, very rural town. It's his hometown. And so I grew up, he was a very distant person in my life. He was a great uncle. His career was taking off in the 80s. I was born in the 70s, but my childhood was spent in the 80s. So he would come back to Winchester to visit, and he was, you know, a rock star. They literally had parades named <laughs> after him. He rode in the parade, um, and one year, the Clemson Clover Parade. The main road in our town is called the Templeton Way. Um, so he was really quite a celebrity in my town, but it was my father that impacted me a little bit more than John Templeton because he decided he would start studying investments full-time, and I was a young child, and he brought me along for the ride with him. So he allowed me to pick one stock per month, and I did that starting at the age of seven or eight. And then when I was older and had graduated from college with a degree in economics, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in finance. And Uncle John tried to get me to start a mutual fund, um, which I did not want to do at the time. But he ended up seeding a hedge fund for me. I was 24 years old. And I worked with him up until the time he died on modifying the strategy. We actually had many different strategies we ran together. He was a tinkerer, I would say, in the investment landscape. In fact, one of the presentations that I heard last night at ValueX really struck me. And I'm really bad with names. I will not remember the name of the presenter. Um, but he was talking about running a screen on micro caps, small caps, stunk companies, a price to book screen. It was very quantitative based. And, you know, Uncle John liked to try a lot of those different strategies and he would put real money behind it. And if it didn't work out, he just said, you know, I've made a mistake in my analysis. That doesn't work. Let's move on to the next. And he always um, gave me advice. His advice to me was to try many things. And one of them would turn into a great long term track record. So I spent my years playing with him. We were modifying screens. We were, um, at one point, he had um, identified a research report that was out of Merrill Lynch, I think, called Contenders and Defenders. And we started a whole fund based off of that strategy. It did not work because we could not get um, the short exposure we needed. It, we had to do it synthetically, and the cost of the shorts was too much and ate up all the returns. But it was really fun learning his style of investments and working with him for a decade. It was a real pr privilege. And the person you're talking about is Jeff Hendrickson. Oh, yes. Who has an Anglo-Saxon aspect to his life in that he studied at Oxford. And actually, he was just here talking to us. And uh, I think that 
you know, I'm a father to two daughters and I have nieces. And it seems like, I mean, I'm curious to sort of probably um, Sir John Templeton had more than one niece. Mm -hmm. And um, how much of that collaboration was the result of particular attributes that you had? Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, you know, in part, I want to hear from you how I should be doing things differently, perhaps, uh, around family members to help them live their best possible futures and maybe what those nieces should be doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any insights that you have through your relationship with your great uncle, either ways in which I should live my life differently or my nieces should live their lives differently? You know, that's such a hard question for me to answer. And if he were alive, I would want to say, why me? Like, what did you see? Why me? And because I don't know why he chose me to go into investments with. Mm. I don't really understand that. Mm. I do think that I've always been very hungry to learn more. And I had um, a desire to work in the investment industry. But there were others in, our, in my family who had wanted to work in the investment industry. And... Um, I don't know. I don't know why it was me. Yeah. But he he did have a tendency. If he saw something in a young person, he would totally get behind you. When I say get behind you, he would fund your strategy. He would fund your business and then walk away. And you had to sink or swim. He was not going to mentor you and spend hours with you. Um, but he did this with many money managers. His um, record of seating managers across Wall Street is really unbelievable. You meet with, uh, I meet with a lot of managers who have been seated by John Templeton, and they were seated by John Templeton when they were very young, usually had no experience, and they were like, I can't believe this. Um, but he, he would let them sink or swim. He would be quick to pull the capital if the strategy didn't work, but he was always trying new things and... I think that one of the things that I take away from this, and it's it's a, a new one for me, is this idea of tinkering. And that mm -hmm. often when we read in the biographies or the stories that get told about public pers pers persons is that the story is told that there is a lot that is pruned away that has to be pruned away in order to tell the story. And because you've spent all this time with him, you can share a little bit of the color behind the story and it's a really important lesson for all of us that we need to tinker. We all need to try lots of things. Uh, when we read about a success, what we often don't read about is the all the failures or mm. all the ways in which things were stopped in their tracks because they clearly weren't working. Sure. And that the person doing that, in this case your great uncle, didn't allow the failures to stop him from continuing to tinker. Correct. Yeah. Um, Scott and I, my husband, Scott Phillips, um, who I work with, uh, we always comment on how unique it was that he seemed to not be phased by the failures at all. Mm -hmm. He just was not affected by them. It was very, you know, you would go meet with them and say, look, this isn't working. This is why. Okay, let's move on. He didn't dwell on it at all. And I think just ac accepted it as part of the process um, to try new things. And, you know, he believed deeply in the scientific method. And um, I think he brought a little bit of that approach to his investment philosophy. And he clearly um, believed in the scientific method and bringing it into his approach with philanthropy and his um, study of uh, spirituality and religion and things like that. I think that um, what comes up for me is that, uh, first of all, uh, so, so I was just talking about how when I have a failure, I think I have a very human desire to go into the bomb shelter and not come out for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And one of the keys to living a successful life is to make sure that the failures don't take us out, that we set ourselves up and that we can often do it simply through position sizing or the, si the size of the bet relative to the resources that we have, that a failure is not going to prevent us from taking new bets. I've realized that one of the ways in which Berkshire Hathaway approaches his acquisitions is that you know one in four acquisitions is not going to work out, but that's mm -hmm. not going to stop Berkshire from continuing to do them. Uh, as the father of children, as you are, are the mother of children, as a parent, 
I am desperate to make sure that my children know that every failure is just a bump on the path to success, Sure. which is um, not an easy thing to teach at all. Yeah. But you mentioned your husband, and I, just before we started, uh, expressed to you that my wife and I have a wonderful relationship in our family, and part of why it works well is that we are not mixed in business. So I have wonderful relationships in business, and that is separate to my family. And in your case, uh, your husband is both the father of your children and is also your business partner. That is unusual. I'm curious to understand as much as I possibly can about how that works because it clearly does work. And mm -hmm. we both enjoyed very much, we, we both, sorry, we all enjoyed seeing you both on the stage yesterday and the very nice interaction between the two of you. How does that work? <laughs> Well, I do think it's unusual. Um, you know, it works very well for us. It's hard to explain. We've worked together for many, many years. Um, he is very intensive in, in the research process. Um, we enjoy working together. I mean, what a wonderful blessing to be able to come with your spouse on a trip to Kloster, Switzerland, and to learn together and develop together. Um, the difficulty is that, you know, if the business or the portfolio performance-wise is in a bit of a rut, um, you can both be a little down together and maybe a little short with each other. <laughs> I think it's probably more comfortable, uncomfortable for people who work with us than un uncomfortable for us. But um, we just really enjoy working together. We've had so many amazing experiences because we work together. Um, like we went on a trip in 2019 to India on the Fairfax India or trip that Thomas Cook organized. And we did that together. So we were learning about the companies in the portfolio and what investing is like in India and the opportunities there. And we get to come home and discuss those things. I mean, we both really enjoy our careers and we could share that with each other. It's, I think, more special. Um, Michael Eisner wrote a book about p partnerships that work in business. And uh, he describes the partnership amongst others between uh, Warren and Charlie and there are a number of other partnerships, and he describes his partnership with um, the guy that he went to work for at Disney, whose name escapes me. Uh, and I think that a new edition of the book would have you and Scott and would look <laughs> in greater detail into what it is that makes a marriage partnership like that work. And you've kind of previewed, so you mentioned Scott when I knew I was going to bring up your partnership with Scott, and then you talked about Fairfax, and that's where I was going to go next. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty special to be a director of Fairfax, a storied Canadian company, to be a director of Fairfax India. Uh, I'm curious, some of the people listening or watching this may feel like they'd like to be directors of something like Fairfax. Sure. Um, did it, how did that unfold? What happened? What, were there any moves that you made that resulted in that happening? Uh, how, did the relationship on, how did the relationship start? How did you become a director? What have you learned since? Yeah. Okay. Well, first, first, let's just say that I am the beneficiary of the Templeton last name. I think that does get me in um, some so doors. Are, and so are it, countless others. And it is a blessing. So, but, so I'm going to interrupt you. I apologize, Lauren. I appreciate you saying that <laughs> and, and because it shows humility. But let's not forget that there are many other people who carry the Templeton name. Sure. And there are many other people who did not start funds, did not become investors, did not work closely with Sir John Templeton. There was something about you that made him pick you to work with. So you've expressed humility. And I want to and, and uh, I just want to go back and say they, that Sir John Templeton found attributes in you. So thank you for the humility, but take credit as well. <laughs> well, I hope he did. Or maybe I was just really, really lucky. I feel very lucky. Um, but let's see, it was probably around 2008, 2009 um, that I started acquiring shares of Fairfax. And maybe in 2010, I arranged a visit with Prem Watza. Um, I knew that he had had a relationship with John Templeton. John Templeton had already passed at this point. Um, so he did not connect us. But I knew that he had had a relationship with John Templeton, and I was curious to meet him. 
Um, and so we arranged a trip to Toronto. I took my daughter, my firstborn child, who was tiny at the time, my parents, my husband, and uh, we all flew into Toronto, rented a minivan, drove to um, Niagara Falls, went back to Toronto, and uh, my father, my husband, and I went and met with Prem. That was the beginning of our relationship. And it was just, you know, getting to know him. He has a bust of John Templeton in his conference room. So that was really fun to see. And then I started attending all of his annual meetings um, and corresponding with him about um, Sir John's philosophy, sharing some of John Templeton's writings with Prem, um, and just taking a larger position in Fairfax over the years and a big interest in Fairfax and attending all the meetings. And uh, he called and extended the invitation for me to join the board, which has been a great privilege. I think um, I always say that if you had asked me prior to joining the board of Fairfax what culture means to a company, I would have given you a very, um, you know, culture is important at a firm and here are the reasons why. But I don't think I really believed anything I was saying until I went on the board of Fairfax. And all I can say is that company has such an impressive culture and it is pervasive from prem down to the receptionist that answers the phone. You see it in their corporate headquarters. You feel it when you meet the presidents. It is such a pervasive culture. It is very humble and hardworking. They are great team members and they, they share their success as a team. It, it's hard to describe, but it's so palpable. And I just know when we're um, talking about different opportunities that Fairfax um, is always going to do the right thing. Wow. So that's, that's, a, that's a special to say about any company in addition to Berkshire Hathaway, which I think we all admire, there's a there's a I know that there is a history that uh, Fairfax and Markel had some common ownership. Uh, uh, they had some common business business interests at some point, and so mm -hmm. those two insurance companies actually have common roots. Mm -hmm. at some point, of, I think of shared investments. Uh, so we we have to um, unfortunately not tarry too much with this conversation because we have the conference to get to yes. and I should tell you that Lauren came straight off the slopes to visit yes if I look strange to you it's because I went skiing one of the great benefits of being at this conference is being able to enjoy all the wonderful activities here in Closters. and we went skiing it was a wonderful powder day spent a little too much time on the mountain took a little <laughs> too much time getting down the mountain so I'm sitting here unshowered in my ski outfit in with, front of all of you. So. Which is exactly the way it should be <laughs> at Value X. And uh, the way we organize it is that we leave the days free for sunlight to get outside, to get some healthy uh, exposure to the elements. And then we do all of our presentations and thinking about investments as the sun is going down in the afternoon, which is where we're about to go. But... Um, it's a great place to make friends too. Yeah. We were just in the ski rental shop this morning and it was like, hey, you're going skiing. We are too. And we ended up with a group of about seven people from the conference and we skied over to Davos and back and um, what a treat. Spectacular. Any uh, in closing, any single idea that you've learned or that you plan to share with the group or a thought that's arisen? that you want to take back with you that you're all ready to share with the broader audience? I mean, there were so many um, things that I learned yesterday, notes I wrote down, things I needed to read, different research services that I might look into. So that's important stuff. I think the relationships will be the most important thing to come out of this conference. And also the idea of continuous learning and how people are doing it out in the open in front of everybody and um, how important that is. That was one of my goals this year, um, to really embrace every opportunity that comes my way and um, 
you know, get over what people think of me and just continue learning and growing as an investor. I really want to grow this year. And I think this is an important first step in the journey of doing that. I think ValueX will help me. Well, thank you. I appreciate you making the effort by being in the audience. You make an extraordinary contribution, as does every other audience member. It's an exhausting um, it's exhausting to be in the conference because we shorten the presentations down to five minutes and I'm getting quite a bit of pushback on that. And the quid pro quo for that is that you just get a, a stream of ideas constantly and most of the people present present. So each one gets to kind of like expose their personality to everyone in the room. And um, so many conversations, I mean, it's kind <laughs> of like insane and um but it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having um, me. I want you to know, Lauren, that it's a long way that you've come. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, in addition to welcoming you back every and any year you want to join, you should never feel like you have to come. And if you only come back every five years, every 10 years, that is also fine. Every time you decide to come, you'll be welcome. And... Um, uh, every time you can't make it, you should feel absolutely fine about that. I don't want anybody oh. <laughs> to ever feel a sense of guilt for not coming back another year because there are so many good things to do in life. So, Well, I would love to come back. The skiing's <laughs> been great. The people are great. I'm having a good time. And you'll be extraordinarily welcome. And it would be lovely if it ends up with your children even. That would be also good. Whom I managed to meet in um, Omaha this year, which was really great. Yeah. I can't wait to bring my children back to Omaha. So. Yeah, it's a special, special thing for kids. Thank you. Thank you.